Hello, hello, everyone. Come, sit, stay a while. Good afternoon. How is everyone today? Good. Good. That's what I like to hear. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Dave Smith. Uh, I am the Android lead for New Circle Training. We do open source training in a number of technologies. Android just happens to be one of them. Uh, I'm going to be here to you today to talk about mastering RecyclerView layouts. Uh, we're not going to talk more specifically about how to use RecyclerView uh, in the general uh, sense today. We're going to be talking mostly about building custom layout managers with RecyclerView and uh, how we can kind of get through that process. So a little bit about why I'm here standing in front of you today. Call it a bit of a Hannah, uh, humanitarian effort. Uh, I'm really here to give you the tools, hopefully, that you will need if you are trying to use RecyclerView, you're trying to customize it for your specific purposes, and trying to get you through that process without losing, you know, essentially losing your mind, okay? So before we dive too deep into the details, I just want to make sure that everybody's on the same page. So where does this all this come from? Um, you know, the this idea of view recycling is a pattern that's used in mobile all over the place. All mobile platforms do this. Android just happens to do it as well. Um, it has done this since version one, um, mo most specifically in the uh, form of list view that most of us have probably used a number of times. Um, just curious, show of hands, how many of you have actually tried to use Recycler View before? Pretty good. How many of you have tried to build your own layout manager? Okay, more than I expected, good. And most of you still have your hair, that's even better. So this, this idea of view recycling is really, it allows developers and it allows devices to present large collections of data, maybe hundreds or even thousands of items to the user, but only using a handful of views not creating as many views as we need to display that data, but instead using a process called recycling or rebinding of data to individual views as the user needs to see them. So basically, like we've got going here, uh, we have this idea that the number of views necessary to show the user their collection uh, is only what we need to be able to show on screen. And as the user is interacting with this content, whether they're scrolling up or around, uh, as views scroll off screen, they're no longer necessary, but rather than creating new views for the new data coming in, we can simply take the old views, repurpose them with new data, shift them to a new location, and allow them to slide back in. So that way we can display hundreds of thousands of items with only a handful of views. Generally, you're going to see uh, recycler views or list views creating as many views as is necessary to display on screen, plus maybe one or two more, depending on how the algorithm works. OK. So again, I'm not going to talk too much about how to use recycler view. I think there's some good documentation on that. But the basics of recycler view is that Recycler view is a more flexible uh, evolution of this pattern that allows us to create these recyclable collections in all kinds of custom implementations. You know, previously we only had list view, which was a vertical scrolling list. There had been some custom implementations done by other developers of ways to do this maybe horizontally or in other custom ways. Um, Recycler view brings that all together into a framework. So because of that, Recycler view cannot be used without a layout manager. The two always have to pair together. In fact, if you try to instantiate a recycler view without a layout manager, you'll get a very unhelpful exception about that will crash your application. Okay? So you always need to set a layout manager before you try to use a recycler view. And to sort of get you started or cover most use cases, the framework has done a pretty good job of providing a handful of its own layout managers that in a lot of cases you might even be able to use wholesale. And if you haven't looked at Recycler View since the L preview or maybe since some of the initial releases, you may have missed some of the layout managers they've added. Because during the preview, really all we had was some basic functionality that was very similar to List View, and they added quite a bit by the time they got to release. So let's just quickly go through what the framework gives us. The first option, which will look Mo familiar to probably most of you is the linear layout manager. So the linear layout manager is essentially the list view replacement, if you will. Um, it's got some additional features in it, but it is, it is a uniform single list of items. One of the neat features of linear layout manager that we didn't have in list view is the optional orientation setup. 
So Linear Layout Manager allows RecyclerView to create a list of items that scrolls either vertically or horizontally, which is a new feature that we obviously didn't have before. Uh, and this is controlled during the instantiation of the Linear Layout Manager just by giving it that vertical or horizontal orientation qualifier there. Okay. The Boolean parameter that's at the end there allows you to also reverse the layout. So the traditional, by setting it to false, would uh, order the items as they viewed in the adapter. So uh, adapter item position zero at the front down to the end. If you set this parameter to true, it will reverse that and have the end of the adapter show first in the list. Okay, so they have that feature in there as well. The next one that we have up here is the grid layout manager. So this is, this one was not in the preview, but the functionality of it is still pretty intuitive to most of us because we've either seen or used grid view before. Now it's a little bit more flexible than that, but the idea here is that we're still having this uniform collection of items, but these items can now be stacked up, you know, either side by side or on top of each other. Uh, just like with Linear Layout Manager, Grid Layout Manager does support orientation changes. So we can do a vertical scrolling list, like the traditional grid view, or we can flip that and do a horizontally scrolling grid instead. Now, the, the number that you see in this uh, declaration here is that the, the Grid Layout Manager supports controlling how many what they call spans are associated with that particular item. Now, the reason they call them spans instead of rows or columns is because of the fact that you can do it in either direction. So a span just simply defines how many items you can stack up. So in a vertical grid, the spans are the columns. In a horizontal grid, the spans would be the rows. Okay. But they're still defined in such a way that they're uniform. So if, for instance, in this case, I have two spans defined, so they will evenly be spaced on both sides. There's not really a mechanism to define, you know, sort of a one-third, two-thirds with the spans, uh, you know, necessarily at this level. Okay. They did add a, a fairly interesting feature, though, that allows you to change the uniformity in, in some basic ways using something called a span size lookup. So in the example that I have here, the grid layout manager still has two spans defined. But using this custom implementation of a span size lookup, we can define at runtime for each individual position how many spans should each item take up. And this is just a very simple algorithm. basically says every third item should take two spans, and all the others should take just the default of one. And this gives us the implementation that we see up here, where every other row is essentially laid out all the way across, but the grid's interspersed in between. So you can create some shifting elements here, but this is always defined in terms of the number of spans available. So this isn't like a, an explicit pixel width or anything like that. You define ahead of time how many spans are available in this layout, and then you can use the lookup to basically tell it how many of those, you could think of them as cells in a table, this specific item should take up. Okay? Um, it, it, one of the important things to realize with grid layout, though, is that the whatever orientation it's in, the item height, or if it's horizontal, the item width, still needs to be uniform for each element block. So for instance, in this example, all the items in the same row have to be the same height. And the, the row height itself will essentially adjust to whatever the tallest item is. So if I had one item in the middle of the other two that was much taller, there would be a gap underneath the two items on either side. They don't slide up to sort of fill in the gaps or anything like that. For that, we have the staggered grid layout manager. So the staggered grid layout manager builds on that pattern and operates and is constructed in a very similar way to grid layout manager. But in this case, we have the opportunity to define different size item views. And the staggered grid layout manager will simply lay them out as best it knows how underneath each other, filling in those individual gaps. Okay. So from an implementation perspective, creating one is, again, no different than working with the other two. And it also supports horizontal and vertical orientation. Okay. Now, one of the uh, one of the things to notice about each of these that I've shown you so far is that while they support different orientations of scrolling, both of these implementations only support scrolling in a single axis at any given time. What would I need to do if I wanted to create a recycler view implementation or say like a simple grid that I want to be able to actually scroll in two directions. Can I do that? 
Well, the answer is yes, The framework's but not going to give you anything to do that. In that case, we have to look at maybe perhaps building our own. So what I've done, and I'll show you the, uh, where you can look at the example uh, at the end of the talk here, is as sort of a case study for what we're talking about here, I went through and decided I'm going to create a two-dimensional scrolling layout that's just a simple uniform grid. Okay, so the grid is going to be laid out. The positions would basically be the way you see them up there, where they're, they order themselves left to right. The grid width is fixed. So the number of columns, it'll just wrap around to the next, and they'll just line themselves up. Like if I was looking at maybe a TV schedule or sports scores in a grid or something like that. And then the user could simply pan and scroll around this content visually in whatever orientation they wanted. Okay. And the question essentially I posed to myself was, can I build this with Recycler View and come out sane on the other side? I'll let you decide when I'm done whether or not that actually worked. Okay, before I talk about the mechanisms of what you need to do to build this, uh, let's discuss a little bit about the internals of Recycler View so that you can get some idea of how these pieces that you may see in the documentation actually fit together. So the first element that I want to talk about and the, the core uh, utility, if you will, that Recycler View gives you is this instance or this concept of a recycler. This is really the workhorse of building a custom layout. The recycler is a utility given to you by Recycler View that does all of the work necessary for obtaining views, caching views, you know, basically doing all the recycling functionality that you need to be able to quickly get new views for new data and toss away views you don't need anymore. Okay. So when you're building a layout manager, your interaction is almost exclusively with the recycler. There, you know, when, when you need a new view with uh, the next position that the user is scrolling into view or something like that, you obtain that view from the recycler by giving it the position value that you want. So this is the next position I need. Please give me the view that has all the data already bound associated with it. And similarly, when you're done with a view, let's say it scrolls off screen and you don't need it anymore, you would toss that back to the recycler so that it can keep uh, access to that around and rebind it to some other data later and hand it back to you at another point. Okay? So all that functionality is bound inside of the recycler. And the recycler's job is to talk to the adapter. So the adapter where all of your data comes from, where you, you create view holders and bind all the data, that is, uh, there's a direct interaction between the recycler and the adapter to get all that information. The key point to remember here is your layout manager should never, ever, ever touch the adapter. That is the recycler's job. If you ha are building a layout manager that somehow is trying to get state information or some other data directly from the adapter, that pattern is broken. Instead, the view holders that are basically forced down your throat by the Recycler View API, those are great places to hold that state because the adapter has access to the view holder and so does the layout manager. And Recycler View does this internally. Uh, you know, all the information that that view knows about its current position, whether it's uh, changing, whether it's being added, removed, all these things that Recycler View uses for these fancy transition animations, that state is all held on the view holder. And you can extend that view holder, which you're obviously supposed to when you build your own adapter. So if you want to stuff more state in there for each individual view, that's the right way to do that. And then that will transport along with the views as they move into the layout manager and, and so on and so forth. So always touch the recycler, never touch the adapter. All right, so let's look a little bit deeper into the recycler itself. So I mentioned that the recycler is a, it's a caching mechanism above all else. So the recycler is where you are, need to get new views and you need to toss away your old views. But it turns out that they actually have a two level mechanism inside to make this work. The recycler has this concept of what they call the scrap heap. And then underneath that is this idea of the recycle pool. Now, the, the difference between them is fairly nuanced, and in a lot of cases, it doesn't really matter. But there are some optimizations that can be made if you understand the difference. Uh, the, the scrap heap is usually the, the first line of defense or where you would typically toss views while you're doing layouts. Um, and I'll, I'll explain to you in sort of a technique how you would uh, possibly use that in your code. But the scrap heap is a, is a very lightweight place where views can be tossed and retrieved back in a, in a very quick fashion, often cases without even having to rebind the data. 
So it, it's a nice place that as a layout manager, you can toss a bunch of views that you know you're going to reuse again. They're still on screen, but maybe you need to shift them around or something like that. And rather than them having to go back to the adapter to rebind data and bring them back to you, um, you can just quickly get them back from the scrap heap and lay them out again. Okay, so typically you'll toss things in the scrap heap first. The recycle pool is more commonly used for views you are certain you don't need anymore. So for instance, after you've run a layout, maybe you have a handful of views that have scrolled off screen and you didn't, you didn't need these and you know that. You can toss those into the recycle pool. The recycle pool is still a quick way of allowing you to get data back, but it tosses away some of the additional metadata. It basically recycles the view holder and keeps the view around. So even though it can quickly rebind data from the adapter, it's a little bit more expensive if you're constantly doing that for every single view. So typically, you would want to throw views you know you don't need and recycle into the recycle pool, toss everything else in the scrap heap. Okay? And I'll show you a technique that kind of allows you to do this on, on two different levels. The other concept that we're illustrating here is the difference between a detachment and a removal. Um, in the methods that I've got up here, th they look like they're bound together, but you can actually do all these operations separately. You can attach and detach, remove, scrap. You can do those things individually. These are just convenience functions. Um, the syntax is a little stinky, in my opinion, because detach is really uh, its a mechanism similar to scrapping that allows you to toss a view away temporarily that you know you're going to reuse in the same layout pass. So the, while the name is detach, a detached view is not technically removed from its parent, which is the recycler view. It's actually still added to that view. The layout manager is just allowed to manipulate it a little bit. So it's much more lightweight, um, but it is still attached to the parent view. A remove view is very similar to a view removal you would have on a, on a view group or anything like that, where it is actually detached from its parent. So it's, it's a little bit difficult because remove actually detaches and detach does not. But you can really think of it as detach is the lightweight and remove is the heavyweight. So typically, in most cases, you would do these things together. So the methods on the recycler for detach and scrap uh, is where you would, you would use that to toss views away that you might use again. And remove and recycle is the one you would use to toss views away that the next time you need it, it's probably going to be for a different, different use case or a different bind. OK. A couple other tips just to know when you're building a layout manager. Um, layout manager, as the name implies, is responsible for measuring and laying out every view in the recycler view. Very similar to the responsibility that a container view group has for all its child views. Uh, however, recycler view uh, provides this additional feature to developers called decorations. How many have used decorations before? OK, pretty good group. Uh, they allow you to provide additional drawing or additional uh, margins or sizing requirements on individual items. So, for instance, with an item decoration, I can define not in the item view itself, but in a decoration, that all of my items should have a margin around them. And it just, the recycler view applies that for me. I don't have to do anything with it. And that's true on the layout side as well. I don't have to necessarily know that when I lay something out, it has a margin and I have to inset it. The API handles that part for you. But it only handles that part if you lay them out appropriately using a different set of methods than you might be familiar with if you've done custom view work in the past. So similarly, all the information about the view is technically wrong if you ask the view itself. If I ask the view for its information, like it's left, right, top, bottom, those are incorrect because they don't account for the decoration. Instead, there are decorated left, right, top, bottom that will give you the appropriate value you might need while you're laying out other views. So for instance, if I'm laying out a bunch of views in a linear fashion, I would use the decorated top and bottom values to know where the previous view was so I can lay out the next one in front of it or something like that. Okay. Similarly, we have methods like that for sizing. So the decorated height and width will account for those margins as well. And as I mentioned, when you're laying out your views, you need to make sure to use the layout and measure methods on the manager, not calling measure and layout directly on the child views. Okay. This will if you don't do these things and you have an implementation that doesn't use decorations, it'll look like it's working. 
but as soon as someone brings in an adapter that has a decoration attached to it, all your layouts will be confused and you won't know why. So as long as you stick to using these methods in your layouts all the time, it'll just work regardless of whether somebody decorated their content or not. Okay. All right. So the next piece that I want to talk to you about is a concept that I call the fill technique. This is how the framework typically does re view recycling. They did it this way in list view. They do it this way in their core uh, layout managers as well. Um, this is a, a function that hopefully will help simplify the concept of how you run a layout and how you sort of build a layout manager. It's all centrally focused around this concept called the fill. The fill is really just a layout operation, but it's all encapsulated into this functionality that is able to check for the current state and account for differences and that sort of thing. So typically what you'll have when you're using this technique is a single method that you write. There's no fill gap or fill X method that lives in Recycler View. You would create an internal method that uh, we just by convention would call fill that does these things that I've listed here. So it's going to be responsible for determining based on the current layout what is the first visible position you can see. You know, the based on how far down the list is scrolled, the first visible view doesn't necessarily mean it's the first visible position. Um, but you, you basically the idea is to enumerate all those individual views and figure out based on the views I have what's the first position I can see? Is it position zero? Is it position five? Whatever the case may be. And you'll typically want to look at that view and also determine its offset. Is the view shifted in any way? Is it shifted up or is it shifted down? And as part of that uh, placement of that view, do I have a gap? You know, have, have the views shifted because of user input, user scrolled the operation, to the point where I've got some extra space at the top that I need to fill with another view? Uh, that's kind of where the term comes from. If I don't, or you know, and maybe it's shifted the other way, then maybe I have a gap at the bottom, and I need to fill something there. So basically, it's discovering what's first, finding gaps where, wherever which edge or whichever corner they may live in, and then scrap everything. This is the part that will save you a bunch of headache. Rather than trying to determine your current state, figure out whether based on if it's shifted this way, do this, if it's shifted that way, do that, just get your current state information about first visible position and where it is offset located, toss everything in the scrap bin, okay? And then from there, take that initial information of the first view and the first location and run a layout pass. Just whatever logic you need to say from this position until I run out of space, grab views from the recycler and lay them out. And then in that case, it doesn't matter what's first or how far it is. You'll always just fill the space with all the, you know, all the views that you need, depending on no matter what state you're currently in. Now, depending on where your gaps are, you might have to make some adjustments. So for instance, if you shift the views down, that gap is above, your first visible position that you actually need to lay out has popped back one. So you may need to make some adjustment based on the gaps, but once you have that initial information and you scrap everything, just run a layout every time. Right? It's not expensive because a lot of these views are already laid out, so calling layout again doesn't change any of their properties. Um, and in, in addition, we've tossed them in the scrap heap, so ret retrieving them back from the recycler is also very cheap. Okay? So I can do this over and over and over again, and as, you know, it, doesn't, uh, it doesn't necessarily affect the performance. I don't just have to try and manipulate the spaces that I need and try to leave all the other views alone. You'll get yourself caught in way too many edge cases if you do that. You can simplify it by just doing the same process every time. And then this method will be called, whether it's an initial layout, whether we're scrolling, or whether any state changes on the recycler view, it's just going to go through this exact same process. All right. Questions you would ask yourself about where are my gaps. And the important thing to remember here is to save as little state as possible, right? You want to discover the information about your view. What's the first visible position? What is its offset? Don't try to track that information because that typically tends to lead to edge cases where you didn't track it correctly and then you, you're branching if statements all over the place. Okay? Use this as, a, as stateless a function as you can possibly do that discovers everything it needs up front and then runs the layout appropriately on each pass.
Okay. Just by way of example, this is what a, f a fill function might look like, or, or you might stub one out. So, you know, at the beginning, you're going to have some logic to determine what the first visible position is. Depending on your layout, that you know, could mean a number of things. It's probably just going to be something simple, like enumerating over all the child views, asking those child's view holders what their position are, and maybe looking for the lowest value. Okay. That would be true for a linear one. It may not be true depending on what your, your layout implementation is. But figuring out what that first visible item is, and if it's necessary, what is its offset? Is it, has it been shifted so that we need to you know, fill a gap or something like that? And then as I mentioned, there are uh, helper methods available on the recycler view to help you toss away views. So the, the two objects that you're going to see passed to you in pretty much every major framework method is a recycler instance and something called the recycler state. And those two things will, uh, will work together for everything that you need to do associated with modifying your layout. So in this case, the recycler is passed to this uh, helper function, which is part of the API. That's not something you have to write. Just detach and scrap attach views. That says toss every view that I has currently attached to me, throw it in the scrap. Okay. And then from there, you can simply iterate through however many views you need, whether you have like a fixed window size or you just want to iterate through views until you've run out of space, whatever algorithm you want to use to do this. Iterate through those views and get each one back from the recycler. So get view per position will tell the recycler, this is the position I want to lay out, and it will give you the view already bound to the data that you need to do that layout with. Okay, And then just like you would in any other view group, you need to add it or attach it measure it, and lay it out, okay? Then from there, the final job is determining if there are any views that were in my layout that I don't need anymore. So when I went through and I scrapped everything, if, if the next step is to lay out just what I need, there may be views that were left in the scrap heap. And those are views that I scrolled off screen or for whatever reason I don't need anymore because they didn't make it back into the layout pass. You can ask the recycler view for its current list of what's in scrap. And if there is anything left in scrap at this stage, I don't need it. So I can recycle it. Okay. So then this will just go through and, and take the views out of the scrap heap and explicitly put them in the recycle pool. Okay. And that's a more efficient way of holding those views when you know that they're going to need to be rebound to data later on. That doesn't mean that if you run out of views in Recycle and the only views that are available are in Scrap that it won't be able to rebind them. Recycler will rebind data from Scrap or Recycle. So it's, it's not something you necessarily have to worry about as to whether it will make your view work correctly. It's just an optimization. If you use Scrap and Recycle appropriately, then you'll have the most optimized recycling behavior in terms of memory management and that sort of thing. Okay. So... One of the advantages from the example that I had put forth of doing, doing this, this uh, has, uh, has to do with view indices. indices. And one of the, one of the first problems, problems that I dealt with when dealing, dealing with this, this, this fixed, fixed grid, grid implementation, implementation was that unlike a traditional linear single scrolling uh, implementation, the view indices aren't always consistent. You know, with something like a linear layout or even a grid layout, you can typically rely on the fact that the first views in the list are the first visible and the last views in the list are the last visible. And you can rely on a, a fairly consistent mapping between uh, view indices and positions. You know, when you scroll up, you would typically insert views at the front. Uh, and if, as you scroll down, you would append them to the end or vice versa. But that's not necessarily true with this case. You know, in this case, if the, if the user is looking at some block of elements in the middle of the grid, the view indices might look something like this based on the way I've laid them out. But you can kind of see that on the left and the right hand side there, those views are part of the range from the adapter's perspective. They just aren't visible right now. So you can imagine that as I shift the window across these views, they will be brought, brought in as groups. So I would bring in maybe four, col or four views in the next column, maybe a couple for the new row, and they'll come in, in in groups that could be coming from all four sides. So if I want to rely on any sort of consistency in the view indices, I need to toss everything away and relay out, and that ensures that child zero is always at the top left, child whatever is at the bottom right.
Okay. Otherwise, I can't. And I'm not saying you have to rely on that, but a little trick to help keep your sanity here is if you can be relatively sure that the child indices are in the right order all the time, then it, it uh, helps simplify some of that inspection logic that you may need to do later on for changes and stuff like that. Okay, so it's just an advantage of using that implementation. And this, depending on your functionality and how you mutate that fill method I showed you, you can use attach and detach manually to reorder these views. So, you know, if, if you're not necessarily scrapping them, but for whatever reason you just want to reorder them so that the same views have different indices that are in this order, detach them all and reattach them in the right order. Okay, that will, that will give them the proper view index from a child perspective inside of the parent parent view. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about the steps to build one of these things. So assuming that you have a proper fill method put together, one that sort of follows that recipe that I showed you, um, this is sort of uh, how we would put these things in place. So the first, the first level that I call it of a working recycler view layout um, is just to get the thing working, right? So the, there's a handful of callbacks you need to, to override and implement just to get an actual layout manager functioning. The first one is on layout children. This is the initial method that will be called by the framework. Anytime a significant layout change happens to the recycler view, the recycler view will delegate to the manager that it, it needs to do a new layout through on layout children. This is not called repeatedly, meaning it's not called on every change, but it'll be called for initial layout. It'll be called if the size of the recycler view changes. If you ever call request layout on the recycler view, this is what you're going to see. And again, if you have an appropriately written fill method, all you have to do in here is run it. Whether you have views in there already or whether it's empty, doesn't matter. You just run your fill inside of here and be done. Okay. But we want to add a little bit of user act in our interactivity to this function as well. Um, so you have to determine or you have to report back to re the framework in Recycler View which axis can this view scroll in. Can it scroll vertically? Can it scroll horizontally? Or, in my case, both. So in most of these cases, you would only return true from one of these methods, but the fixed grid uh, implementation returns it for both so that it can scroll both horizontally and vertically at the same time. If you don't return true from these methods, then uh, the recycler view implementation simply won't deliver events back to you knowing that you're scrolling in one direction or the other. Basically locks scrolling in that particular orientation. But the actual implementation of the scrolling functionality happens in the scroll x by methods. So scroll horizontally or vertically by. These methods will be called repeatedly, very similar to the scroll by methods you would see on a view or a view group as user interaction is coming in. So it is the responsibility of the layout manager to handle moving the views. Recycler view doesn't do that for you. Okay? It just gives you the information up front to be able to do that. So these methods will be called with the information that the framework has determined from the user input. Basically they'll give you a delta value, and this is called incrementally, of how far the framework thinks you should shift your views. And of course in which direction, horizontally or vertically. Okay? And then it will be up to you to actually do the movement, as well as making any determinations about boundary conditions, right? The, the layout manager is responsible for telling the framework when you've hit the end of the content, and you need to stop scrolling in that particular direction, okay? Now that report is actually done in the terms of the return value. So when whatever value you return from this function designates to the framework how far you actually traveled. And then the framework will make a determination based on how much, how far it told you to travel. If there's a difference there, it assumes it's hit a boundary. And it's going to do things for you like drawing edge glows and other edge effect behavior that you probably don't want to see if you're not all the way at the end. So you have to be very careful about how that return value actually comes up. So this is kind of an example of what you might see, this is a, a snipped version of what's in fixed grid for scroll horizontally. So you're given a value that they call, in this case, dx. That's how far they think you should scroll. The first thing you have to determine, perhaps based on which direction that scrolling occurs, is can I scroll that far or have I hit a boundary and determine how far you're actually going to shift. Now the nice thing is you don't have to iterate over the child views and individually move them. Recycler view layout manager provides uh, f these offset children methods, both horizontal and vertical, that will do the, the work of shifting all views that are currently attached. So all you have to determine is the actual difference and then just pass that into the method. But 
because recycler view doesn't really know how your layout looks, once the views have been moved, you may have created a gap. So it's up to you to go back and run another fill. Okay. Now in my implementation, and you can look at the details uh, in the example on GitHub, but in my implementation, I actually provided a direction keyword back to the fill just to help sort of assist when I needed to shift my, my positions backwards or forward based on which way the scrolling was going on. That's not really required in the technique that I'm describing. It just it was helpful for my bi-directional scrolling, um, but it, it's not really part of, it's whatever your algorithm needs uh, you know, to be able to, to do that in the most efficient way. Okay, and then as I mentioned, the return value there has to be the difference of what was actually scrolled. If you just take this and you just return DX, you'll never end up scrolling. And if you always return zero, you'll never scroll at all. Anytime you try to scroll, you'll just get infinite edge glows all the time. Okay, so you have to be very specific about when you can and when you can't move based on whether or not you've hit a boundary of your content. Okay. At a minimum, that's it. That's all you really need to implement to get a working layout manager, something that will lay views out, you can move them around, you know, and all the things you would expect from a user interaction perspective. Now, there are additional features you can add and probably should add over time, but that's sort of the basics. Like, if you can get that far, you can at least determine if your algorithm works and your layout functionality is okay and all that sort of thing. Um, the next step, if you have additional time, is typically to start reacting to data set changes. Okay, and there's really not a whole lot of work to do here. Most of it is built right in, but there is one additional method here called on adapter changed that you can provide some optimizations inside of. You don't have to override this, but it can be helpful. Um, this will be triggered if the recycler view ever is provided with a completely different adapter instance. So if, they're call, if they call set adapter again with some other object, then this will be called in the layout manager, and you can use that f as an optimization opportunity to simply clear all the views. Now notice I'm not tossing them to the recycler. I just want them removed completely. The assumption here is that if we're getting a completely new adapter, it's definitely new data, and it's probably going to be new view types as well. So there's no need for me to dump everything I have into the recycler because it's just going to end up having to toss those away later anyway. It's not that it would break if it did that, but we can optimize that out by saying if the adapter changes, just remove everything. Bypass the recycler, don't collect $200. Okay. Now, we all know notify data set changed on an adapter, right? If, if something has changed in the data, we trigger this method to update the view, right? Just was that way in list view, still exists in recycler view. At a, at a base implementation, you don't have to do anything different here. A notify data set change just triggers a new layout change, and if your fill, again, is set up appropriately, you just relay out, right? The only thing you might want to persist, and this is sort of implementation dependent, is for, a, uh, for an adapter change, you might want to persist what the current first position was. So you may want to discover that before you run your fill. But again, depending on how you've written your fill, you're probably already doing that anyway. So it can attempt with the new data to lay out from the same first visible position. Okay? But if, you, if you've tossed those away already or something like that, you may want to track that value just very briefly until the new layout comes around or something like that. Otherwise, you could just lay it out from the beginning and it would still work. The one uh, caveat to this is that if your adapter has stable IDs, uh, Recycler View assumes at that point that it actually has enough data to try and animate the change. And so calling notify data set changed will trigger an animation sequence. And we'll talk about animations a little bit later. But if, you, if your adapter doesn't do that, this will just be a, a snap layout. Okay, and it'll adjust to the new data. All right. Well, let's say that we happen to have a little bit more extra time on our hands and we want to get a little bit more fancy with this functionality. Um, the next feature that we could add to our manager is targeted scrolling. So the external APIs for allowing a developer to scroll your layout to a specific position, whether that's immediately or in some animated fashion, again, are not baked in. You have to provide some implementation of how that works. So for the scroll to position case, which is a non-animated case, it can be pretty simple. Just like in the case I mentioned before, you would need to track somehow what the requested position was and then just call request layout. That will trigger a new layout, which will trigger on layout children, which you can just do a fill. 
right? So if you, you can start to see how if you do your fill right, it becomes everything to you, and you don't have to do a whole lot else to sort of decorate around it, okay? To get a little bit more fancy, we have the smooth scroll to position, and this is where we would want, as a developer, we would want the view to actually animate into place, okay? Now, the, the functionality for doing this requires an implementation of something called a smooth scroller. This is an abstract class provided by the, uh, by the framework that you can override and create your own implementation of essentially what should happen on an incremental basis as it animates around your view trying to find the target. Okay. This uh, interface is actually fairly complex. There's, I, I can't remember, five to ten methods that you have to override to make that happen. Um, you can certainly do that if you're, not, uh, if you're not happy with the behavior that the framework gives you. But there is an implementation called Linear Smooth Scroller that is provided uh, in the support package that you can just extend. This does most of the work for you by providing a linearly interpolated animation on its way to whatever the target position is. And the only piece of information you have to provide in this case is where is the target position? And that's from a coordinates perspective. So when, when this method is called smooth scroll to position, you basically have to figure out, well, what's the first visible position I have now? What's the target that they're trying to get to? And then this computation of what they call a vector on what is the direction that I need to scroll to get there? Is it left? Is it right? Is it up? Is it down? Is it diagonal? but it has to be some linear value, okay? And so you would typically figure out what's the conceptual distance between the two based on, you know, whatever guess you can put together. If I In my case, all the views are the same size, so I could have a really good guess because I knew exactly how far I would need to travel, but that may not necessarily be the case. It doesn't have to be the exact distance. It just has to know the direction. And then Linear Smooth Scroller is going to go through and run in an incremental fashion. They're going to walk through. Uh, they're just going to incrementally animate and scroll in whatever direction it needs to get to that position. And it'll scroll, can see if it's been laid out. Scroll again, see if it's been laid out. It's just going to hunt and hunt until the position that it's interested in has finally come into the layout. So it's just going to be triggering your scroll methods that you've already written. And then as soon as it finds that value, then it will stop scrolling. Once it's vi fully visible on, on the display, at that point, then it will just it'll end. Okay? So you can override the smooth scroller, set the target position, and just start it. And that's really the simplest end of the implementation to animated scrolling. Okay? All right, the last piece. If you have a lot of extra time and maybe some sanity left, you can attempt to add some animation support. Now, out of the box, RecyclerView does support what they call defau default item animations. Okay? One of the new features of RecyclerView that was not as easy to implement on something like ListView was if you inserted a new item or removed it or made some changes, animating all that in a nice, fancy way for the user. Okay? The, the functionality with all of the core layout managers is to provide a very basic algorithm for that out of the box. And I have an animation to show you what that looks like, but essentially it just looks at the views, looks at the change uh, before and after, and then tries to determine based on this layout and this layout and the two snapshots, what views have gone away, what views are new, and what views have moved around. And it will fade out the old views, fade in the new views, and simply translate the other ones on screen. Okay. And in a lot of cases, it does a pretty good job, but you'll see there are some problems with what you get for free if you're doing a custom layout, because you may be animating views off screen that because they're no longer there, the default animation just thinks they've disappeared. So it fades them out instead of gracefully moving them to where they conceptually were supposed to go. Okay. And so we'll take a look at uh, what you need to do to sort of provide that. So Android calls that predictive item animations. And if you want to support that in your layout manager, you just have to tell them. Just say, yes, I support predictive animations, return true from this method. And this will change your layout behavior just a little bit. In this case, anytime an item change is triggered, now for an initial layout or anything like that, this is still going to be the same, but you remove an item or you insert an item, something like that, and that item is visible at the moment, then the layout process actually becomes a two-pass layout. It calls on layout children first in what they call the pre-layout state. This is a state where all the views, all the data from the adapter is massaged such that it looks the way it would have looked before the change. 
This gives you an opportunity to run a layout pass in what they call the pre-layout or the, the initial snapshot. Okay, So from, a, from the views on screen perspective, this means you would just run your traditional fill, but you might need to make note if any of the views that were on screen were removed, you've got gaps to fill. And if you just let the default animations do their work, they will animate until they can see that gap, and then they'll just fade the new view in. But if you wanted to make it look like the view actually slides into place, you have to lay it out during this pass, and you lay it out in the location off screen where it should come from. Okay? So those are what they call appearing views, and they give you additional information on the layout parameters, which you can get from the view holder, for each individual view as to whether or not this view that you can see has actually been removed, and in the next step, it's gone. And if that's the case, you say, well, I've got maybe two or three views that were removed. I need to make sure I add two or three appearing views in wherever they should be so that the animation brings them in the way they're supposed to look. Okay? So you want to take note of how many are removed so that you can use that for the appearing views. The other thing that you would typically do during this step is take some stock of what's currently in the layout so that after the fact, you can determine if any of the views had bit that weren't ne explicitly removed are no longer in the layout because they shifted off screen. And if that's the case, you need to lay them out during the second phase, which is the, the regular layout phase, in their off screen positions. Okay? So during pre layout, you have to lay out those appearing views and just take note of what the state of that snapshot is. And then run your fill the way you normally would. Then that method's going to be called again. And in this case, that is pre layout is going to be set to false. And this is no different than any other fill. Now, all the adapter positions and all the values are set the way they are after the change. And you can lay everything out. And then you just have that final step of saying, OK, at this point, I don't need this piece in it, or this piece has gone away. I need to lay it out off screen so that the animation can slide in the right direction. OK? Let's, uh, let's take a look at a quick example here. You can get an idea there. So now your on layout children might look a little bit more complicated, right? So during pre layout is where you're going to make that information, check that information about how many views were actually removed. Were there any? If there was a view removed, then I need to account for that by uh, adding some ap appearing logic. So in, in my implementation, if you look at the example, I added that to the fill. So the fill has also passed if there are any additional appearing views that it needs to add, and it lays those out in addition to what it would otherwise be able to see. Okay, so that's kind of hidden in here. Um, and similarly, we can look after pre-layout, after we've done our fill for real, and we can check that scrap list again and say, well, is there anything that was left in scrap? If there was, then those are actually disappearing views. They weren't removed or and they, you know, anything like that. So we need to lay them out again. So you, you could run a fill. What, what's usually easier is just to abstract that layout logic and call it again for that specific view and figure out this is where the view should be off screen. Okay. All right, so just quickly, I'll show you what that difference looks like. Okay, so with default item animations on the example that I had, this is kind of what you get, and you can, you can see how it's not exactly what we were looking for. So in this case, the red view is the one we're going to remove, and the green views are the ones that should shift location, but they don't quite do what they're supposed to, right? So when we remove this view, what happens is that all the views on the left also fade out, and then they fade in in their new locations. And that's because it do, the recycler view doesn't know any better. It just knows that after pre-layout, they weren't there anymore. And then it, when I scroll over to see where they actually are, they'll show up there in the new layout. Okay? By adding proper predictive animation support, I can modify that behavior. And again, this is the way the example actually works if you go run it. Um, I can modify that behavior so that those green views slide off screen to where they're supposed to go into that direction. Okay, now as from the user's screen, they'll probably just slide off screen unless this is a large enough display for them to actually see the whole thing. Um, but in that case, uh, they actually, th you get the benefit of the user seeing where they should go so that when they scroll over, they're actually there, right? It's that idea of teaching the user how things are supposed to go by animating them to the proper locations. If they just all fade out, they might think they remove them all, which is not correct. Okay, so that's the idea behind implementing predictive item animations to give you some better info. Okay. So, 
Just a couple more pieces of information to wrap up here. So the example that I've been discussing here uh, is on my GitHub page. It, that application also has a few other basic samples in it for using the grid layout managers and things like that. But it has the full source code for that fixed grid implementation, so you can dive into all the hairy details if you're interested. Um, I also went through a series of fairly detailed blog posts as I was building that thing. So if you want to get a sense for how much hair I actually tore out while doing this, you can go through and read that. Uh, specifically, if you're doing anything similar to what I did with that, that sort of disconnected range where the grid and what you're seeing is actually just a subset of the overall layout, but the views that are in between are actually in the middle of the range, which you wouldn't typically have with the linear, you might want to read the last blog post that I call the Redux, where I actually discuss some of the bugs and issues with the Layout Manager API that actually makes that implementation much more difficult than it should be, and some of the things you have to do to work around that. If you're doing a much more simpler implementation that's either single axis or doesn't have that disconnection problem, then you won't have any issues like that, but it might be an interesting read. And then the SDK also has some pretty good documentation on just getting you started uh, with Recycler View there. Okay, so looking at the time, I don't know, do we have any time for questions? Couple, okay. So we'll take a couple questions, uh, and then if there are any more, we'll, we'll kind of walk off stage. So I saw a hand over there first. Uh, so I have built my own app manager, but I use sort of linear layout manager stuff with Ivy Vector. Um, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the What do you mean by they don't affect the decorators? So like, like the, so like the decorators, for instance, is like a five or two right? So if the, the first item disappears, it, it shrinks, and then everything shifts up towards, right? But the divider doesn't actually that's correct. Yeah, the 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 information uh, because depending on how you implemented the actual decorator, if you're using that information of uh, basically what's the height or the width of the child to know where to draw those lines, um, that information is not updated incrementally. Um, so it's only going to be updated when it's in its initial state, and then after the change, it should give you the new information. So you might see it jump into where it's proper position is, but it won't transition like that because that information is not, uh, you, if I call, again, get decorated height on that view on each of those instances, it's not going to change until the, the value is actually in its new state. Because from, from that perspective, the height itself is not incremental. It has its initial state and its final state. The only thing that changes is the drawing. So you'd have to You'd have to somehow listen for that event and try to trigger it manually, which you can do. Um, the layout manager does have a handful of methods for on item removed, added, inserted, that sort of thing that can signal you when that event is occurring so that you can try to match it as best you can with your animation. Um, but otherwise, yeah, unfortunately, it doesn't give you that feedback directly in the decorator. Yes? Uh, so when you talked about layout managers right at the beginning, you said that keeping a lot of state is bad. Can you give an example of where a state <coughs> that would be kept that is good? And should you be uh, aiming to be fully stateless? Aim to be fully stateless if you can manage it. Um, in, in my, so I'll give you an example from the way I built it. So the initial implementation that I wrote, um, I track very heavily things like the first visible position and that position offset. And I kept that state around all the time. And when, when we started doing data set changes where we went from like a really large grid to a really small grid or something like that, uh, trying to assume that that value was even valid anymore led to a long list of if statements. Well, if I shifted all the way down, then I need to shift back. But if I shifted from here, I need to do this. And if I had just basically run a new fill where at that point I say, okay, based on what I've got, what am I supposed to be able to see? It would have been a much simpler flow. So, I mean, uh, as far as good state to track, I mean, the only thing that I would recommend in a basic implementation you track is any target positions you're, you're moving towards. So if you're doing a linear scroll or if you're doing a scroll to position and you're going to get a new layout pass, you kind of have to track where you want to go because that's not passed around for you. Um, but in general, anything about the current state of the layout, if you can get away with it, and in most cases I think you should be able to, you shouldn't have to track anything. And if you do and it's per item, stick it in the view holder. Uh, let me see. One more question I think we have time for. Yes? Uh, you mentioned that 
override or passing in a scroller to smooth scroll to position. Yes. I'm curious if you also looked into uh, overriding the scroller that's not touch of uh, scrolling. If you found a way to do that. Oh, you mean like for fling behavior? Uh, it's not really exposed. So if you were to do it, you would have to override the recycler view itself as well and kind of modify the API a little bit. So I haven't really looked at doing it. Um, it would be possible, but it's it's not given to you. That behavior is really defined internally. The only one you're given is the uh, is the animation part of that that's not user directed. Cool. All right. Well, thanks for your time, guys. If you have any other questions, I'll step off to the side here and we can address them then.